All right. Uh, welcome, everybody, and thank you so much for taking time uh, to join us for this webinar. Um, my name is Aman Govil. Um, I work at Google as a product marketing manager, um, and I was one of the people who started this project at Google. And with me on the line is also Mike Glasser. Um, Mike, if you want to introduce yourself. Hey guys, my name is Mike Glasser. I'm with Google uh, Marketing Manager out of our New York City office. Um, and thank you for, for joining us today. Cool. Um, and then uh, what we're going to do today is take you through the four um, campaigns that are part of Project Rebrief from Coke, Volvo, Avis, and Alka-Seltzer, and uh, give you a little bit of taste around uh, you know, how the ads work, um, a little bit of uh, behind-the-scenes commentary, and, and a couple of video clips that show sort of how the project came into into being. Um, you know, so it'll be a good mix of live demos uh, and, and video, and we won't just bore you with, with PowerPoint. So it should be entertaining, uh, and we'll take about uh, 45 to 15 minutes to go through the content. If you have any questions, please just type them, and, and you'll see in your send to option Mark uh, Walkenberg, um, who's with Mike, and he'll be collecting all the questions which we will answer towards the end of the presentation. Um, so with that, I'm actually going get, to get started um, in Project Rebrief. And so the, you know, the core idea here was that we wanted to, to really test technology and digital as a medium and what it can do to bring big advertising ideas to life. And so we took some of the most iconic ads from an era which saw a transition from print to television and the greatest minds behind that era um, and started this project where we said, what would happen if we take uh, those ads and that insight that was true 50 years ago um, and reinterpreted it for a modern audience? So the first thing we're going to do is instead of me trying to explain the project, we're going to play a little video um, that Mike has set up. Um, this gives you a flavor of the project and also is the trailer for the documentary film that we have made on the project, um, which I'll talk about later. Um, so Mike, if you want to just keep the video. The way the technology is used today, you've got handheld devices, you've got screens, you've got three screens. People can communicate, they can share and search. There are way too many ads on every single page. Too much focus on technology and not enough on people. The users are telling us what they're interested in, where they want to go. The first display ad basically said, find out more, click here. And then the 15 years that followed, that's basically the only innovation we saw. If you can think it, you can build it. If you have time to make it, you have time to make it wonderful. To come up with great display advertising, you need to first come up with just great advertising. I can't believe I ate that whole thing. You ate it, Ralph. Trying harder is still the best way to do business. You can drive a Volvo like you hate it. And I try to buy the world a Coke and keep it company. It's the real thing. Technology has left me pretty much in the past. I'm not sure that it can be done. Howie believes we're geniuses. I believe we're idiots, and we're both right. <laughs> My own impetus is a little bit of insecurity. Can you do it, champ? How do we tailor that for banner? That's your job. <laughs> From my generation, that's absolutely science fiction. I don't think we estimated the power of this. So hopefully that video gave you a good taste of you know the, the project, the inspiration, and, and the work behind it. Um, I do encourage you, to, you guys to go and watch the film on um, projectrebrief.com. Uh, but getting back to today's presentation, I mean, the big topic is really what was you know the simple brief for this project: can the biggest ideas fit in smallest of ad spaces? Um, so if you go to the next slide, right, what we tend to see is when we ask people about banner ads, right. Um, you know, 
that's the first reaction that, that comes to mind, clutter and more clutter. Um, and it's sort of a superficial reaction that all of us have because of the legacy of you know some of the years where banner ads were not the most creative medium, where they didn't keep up pace with what was happening on the web. And, and that's you know sort of the stigma around banner ads that we are trying to get around with this project is to really not look at banner ads and on mobile and tablets and desktops as just you know ad units, but as little boxes that can do anything uh, that the web can do. And how do we make those ads uh, you know reflect you know what makes us love the web? Um, so if you actually really look at just the evolution of digital advertising from you know the very first ad that was ever shown on the web, uh, which is what you see on the uh, left here, where it says, "Have you ever clicked your mouse here?" It was run in April 1994 um, for AT&T, I believe it was on Wired.com um, at that time. And then over the years, with search, uh, you know, animated banners and um, and some of the more marquee examples that you've seen, uh, you're seeing in that uh, slide, we saw an evolution in terms of what ads were on the web were capable of doing, and they started reflecting more and more um, of all the technologies and experiences that we love on the web. So really, the, the idea behind this project, as we decided to go make these new ads, was let's make these ads for the modern web, uh, for phones, for tablets, for for desktop browsers. And, you know, and build every piece of technology and build experiences into them that make us love and, and spend so much time on the web every day. Um, so if you move to the next slide. Um, so this is you know, a, a very simple summary of uh, the project. Was we have those four iconic ads from Coke, Volvo, Avis, and alka Seltzer that we'll go through, and the five legendary creatives behind them. And that was sort of a big impetus for the project, is not just us taking old ads and saying, hey, we're going to make them better instead, we're going to work with the people who came up with the original insights and the original ideas and, and really interpret their uh, work and their insight for today's audience in a new light um, alongside with them. And that was you know, the big experiment. Uh, so we'll go through the ads um, that, we, that came out of this as well as it was a film that we made which actually shows behind the scene pr uh, process over a period of eight months. Um, so with that, I'm actually going to just dive into the first of our ads. Um, so we, uh, this was Volvo's ad campaign in 1962 called Drive It Like You Hate It. It started as a print campaign and then became a TV campaign a year later. And what you're going to see now is the first ever television ad that Volvo ran in America um, back in 1962. Volvo gets over 25 miles on a gallon of gas, just like the little economy cars and runs away from other popular priced compacts in every speed range. the ad in terms of the creative direction production, it was a very crude, very basic television ad compared to today's standards, but in its day, um, it was you know, one of the best television ads that had ever been done. Um, but actually, the, you know, moving away from the ad itself, the idea behind the campaign was based on a very simple insight that Emil Gargano, um, who was the creative director um, on this campaign and then later went on to start Polly and Gargano um, uh, in the following decades. Um, was about a very simple message that set Volvo apart in its time. Back in the early 60s, uh, you know, durability was not a, a byword for the uh, majority of the car market. And Detroit would sell you cars every three to four years. Whereas a Volvo on average lasted three times longer than any other car available in the market. So that became the byword of uh, this campaign where they wanted to tell the story of the durability of the car. Um, and as you saw in that ad, that story was told in print and television ads through that line, drive it like you hate it, because love and hate are sort of the same sides, uh, are, uh, two sides of the same coin. Um, so our challenge was you know, you know, that reliability as, as a medium and durability as a, uh, as a concept in the automotive world 
has come a long way and, and you don't expect uh, to buy a new car every two or three years as you did back then. So how do you bring that, that concept of durability to life? Um, and the thing we decided not to do I mean, was quite literally take a car and drive it like you could hit it from, uh, from a web or a mobile experience. Uh, so what we're actually going to show you next is a little clip um, of our team actually working with Emil Gargano at his uh, home on how we stumbled upon the idea uh, along with him on, on, uh, for the new ad. Um, and I'll just let the clip do the talking. Mike, if you want to play that. Let's keep it hugely informal. We don't have to worry about protocol or courtesies of any kind. First, let's articulate an objective, then a strategy, then let's look at the work to see if the work meets both of those criteria. He kept telling us every step, like, well, why do people buy cars? Why do, how do you compare it to other cars? He didn't push us towards his ad. He didn't talk about his ad at all. He went going back to the car and how do we bring out the relationship between you and the car? I think that's, we're trying to crack two things. One is um, reimagine this ad, but also to prove how amazing that, that the contextual advertising could be or... Have you considered taking an actual owner who may have 240,000 miles on a Volvo? I was looking at the, the Volvo 100,000 mile club, and the guy who started that is a guy who has 2.7 million miles on his Volvo. Oh. Oh. Now there's that's where you should, there's the guy. You have to get you have to get a hold of that guy. That's great. He's, he's in New York. See, that that to me is great advertising. When you can take something like that and turn that into a nice piece of human film. That's a great story. Boy, that is that's that's real substance. That's wonderful. How do we make that? How do we tailor that for banner? That's your job. <laughs> Guys, as you saw there, you know, that was actually the idea that we ended up um, working on, and then that was completely original in, in the film that you're seeing, um, of taking this guy's story, Irv Gordon, who has um, three million miles, on, almost three million miles on his car, and bringing it to life in a very uniquely digital way. Um, and at this point, I'm going to hand over to Mike uh, to actually demo the app for you and, and how we brought that story uh, for Irv Gordon to life. Mike, do you want to take over? Sure. Thanks, Alman. Um, so what we're going to do right now is, is we're going to hop out of the presentation and go to a live, uh, a live demo. Um, so bear with me with one second while I switch over to our web browser. You should see um, a mocked up YouTube page right now. So as you heard in the video, uh, we, we stumbled upon this gentleman named Irv Gordon uh, who lives out in Long Island. He's a 1966 Volvo with almost 3 million miles on it. Um, when we discovered this, we sent out a team just to spend some time with Irv uh, and, and basically capture all his stories of the last, you know, 40-some years uh, with his car. Um, we went on some road trips with him, and we basically got some really good footage, footage and we turned that content into a whole immersive experience that I'm going to show to you right now. So what we have here is a mocked-up YouTube homepage. Um, and let's say from a, from a media standpoint, um, we know a little bit about a user uh, that's, that's visiting the page. So normally all of these media settings would happen in the background, but right now we're going to fake it. And so when I click Add Settings here, um, what I'm going to do is you'll see Select Audience, and we have different audience cues, outdoorsy, right? The person's into the outdoors, or the person is into travel. I'm going to go ahead and select, you know, Fashionista. So we may know this based on the person's uh, past browsing history, maybe as an advertiser, uh, you've purchased third-party data, interest category data. Um, but either way, we use that signal to drive a very relevant story from Irv Gordon's life to you as the user. So as a fashionista, you visit YouTube, and this is the first thing you see. Uh, the countdown to 3 million miles, start the countdown. getting to the three million miles. It's about the trips that got me to the three million miles. You can drive a 
Bobo. Like you hate it because they're built that way, you know? They can take a lot of punishment. I'm driving down to Hempstead, North Carolina. Coming down to see a childhood friend I uh, haven't seen in a long, long time. It's been 50 years since I've seen her. I was on my way to Paris. I figured this is a great opportunity to pick her up some French perfume. I could mail it, or I could deliver it. I was just waiting for the right opportunity to deliver it in person. So that's more fun than sticking in the box. Well, I hope she'll be happy with her gift, and uh, I hope she'll be happy to see me uh, in that order. now is as we finish up that video you're taken to this uh, expanded masthead unit a full a rich media ad um, that acts very much like an app that you might interact with on a, on a tablet um, and now that we're at this at this screen what I want to do is call your attention to, to three different parts of this ad experience the first is down along the bottom we have this timeline that begins with Irv Gordon and the first 48 hours uh, he spent with his Volvo. Um, uh, Mike, I'm just going to, sorry, I'm just going to pause you. I think there's a little bit of lag on the screen right now for about five seconds from what you're seeing. Um, okay. Because we're still seeing the video on, uh, on our end. Sorry. So, let's give us no, a, thank you. When we spent time with Irv, we filmed a number of those short vignettes. Um, and we filmed them uh, specifically around these different interest categories. So fashion, i.e. this perfume delivery, maybe adventure or outdoor travel. Uh, and for that, we, we chronicled a story about Irv and this 1,500-mile uh, road trip he took when he first uh, got his car. Um, and the idea there was to film content that we felt would be most relevant to different uh, consumer segments that Volvo would want to go after. And based on the information that we can infer from a user visiting YouTube, we serve up the, what we feel is the most relevant story. Um, after you've seen that film, you're taken to this, this experience right here, an expanded unit. Um, and I want to first call attention to this timeline because while we showed the first video, the, the fashionista, the perfume delivery, we have a number of other videos starting with the first 48 hours that Irv spent with his car, uh, moving ahead when he first met his, his wife. Uh, he took her on a 260-mile road trip just to go to dinner in Little Italy, Baltimore family trips to Luray Caverns in Virginia. And the idea is you're invited to, to explore and learn more about Irv's relationship with the car, but also to become part of the story. So while Irv talks about a 260-mile dinner date he had with his wife, the ad also makes a recommendation for you that says, hey, you live in New York City. Here's a great dinner recommendation 260 miles away. And it invites you to participate in this, this experience. As we move forward in time, you notice at the very top, the odometer changes to reflect the, the approximate mileage that Irv had on his car at the time. The reason why it does that is if we go to uh, now or today, this mileage at the very top of the ad is the exact mileage in his car. With Irv's permission, we place the GPS device in the trunk of his car that transmits in real time both the odometer setting as well as the location uh, on this map. And what I can do right now is if we hit C. Irv's location, we plug into the Google Maps API and, with, again, with his permission, show where he is. So right now he's out. Oh, he's in his hometown, which is just out on Long Island. When we've tuned in in the past, he's been in Virginia, he's been in Ohio, he's been as far South as North Carolina, but I, I promise you this, he's truly always driving. It's kind of neat to check in on him every once in a while. The last thing I wanted to call your attention to is um, we've also incorporated uh, Google Plus. 
And so uh, introduced Irv Gordon to G+. This, again, uh, adds another element of, or another way to invite consumers in to participate in the dialogue. So Irv, when he does uh, post to his G plus feed, uh, people tend to write back. And again, it's all participatory. It's in involving them in this journey uh, to 3 million miles. Um, I'm going to think I'm going to I'm going to close out of here and I'm going to take us back to the presentation if you want to uh, wrap up this part of the case. Right, thanks Mike for the demo. Um sorry guys for the, the slight lag um in the streaming. Um so really I mean as as Mike demonstrated right what we were trying to do with this particular execution was to you know figure out how do we tell a story in in the digital world like we all talk about telling good stories but the beauty of you know comparing this same idea um, in the digital world versus sort of the more traditional world is that it's an ongoing story. You know, in, in, if you were to make this into a TV campaign, we would make you know a few of these films into 30, 60, uh, 90 second spots and run them as, as films looking backwards into Earth's life, which is what we do on the web as well, except with social and you know with maps and some of the other little features that we've built with the car. It allows people to become a part of the story that Irv is still writing. So the campaign's not about Irv's 2.99 million miles. It's about you know the countdown to 3 million miles, and it's a living, breathing campaign that people can participate in. So it's just one way where technology allows you to tell a story differently and and you know extend it um, beyond where traditional mediums sort of stop. Um, so that's about Volvo. Um, next, we're actually going to go um, into Alka-Seltzer, uh, and what we're going to show is really what was the birth of the viral video. And when I say viral video, in the sense it was one television commercial uh, in 1972 that really put Alka-Seltzer on the map uh, at that point. And, and the big difference um, compared to that was that this became the water cooler conversations. I can't believe I the whole thing was a line that people started using in common parlance back in 1972 and, and still use it. So let's just revisit the ad quickly, and, and then I'll get back to it. I can't believe I ate that whole thing. You ate it, Ralph. I can't believe I ate that whole thing. No, Ralph, I ate it. I can't believe I ate that whole thing. I hate to Alka-Seltzer. Alka-Seltzer neutralizes all the acid your stomach has churned out. For your upset stomach and headache, take Alka-Seltzer and feel better fast. Did you drink your Alka-Seltzer? The whole thing. All right, so, so let's get back to our slide, right? Um, so the insight here, you know, that uh, the team Bob um, Pascalina and Howie Cohn were trying to do in 1972 was a feeling and a setting that resonated with all of America, even though this was a broadcast ad across three networks at prime time. It was a feeling of having overeaten uh, and suffering from indigestion that all of us have gone through at some point in our life. Um, you know, and Ralph, the character sitting there with his wife, Eleanor, was you know, in a setting that the average salt-of-the-earth guy in America could associate with you know, right after he had had a big dinner. So, so our challenge was, you know, people still use the line. Uh, I can't believe I hit the whole thing. If you search on the web, uh, you'll find a lot of real-time results of people posting that. Um, people still are going to suffer from indigestion, um, except that relation has, is not associated with Alka-Seltzer anymore, right? The line is not the Alka-Seltzer line, and indigestion and is not Alka you know, Alka is not the primary product for that. So that was really the challenge, and how do you marry the two and give the ownership of that line back to Alka-Seltzer? Um, so if you move forward. Um, you know, what we really started doing was we actually brought the idea of I can't believe I ate the whole thing to life by telling Ralph's story leading up to the moment in the original ad. Um, and, you know, we made it into three 1970s style sitcoms that actually allowed us to tell different funny stories in the morning and afternoon and uh, in the evening with breakfast, lunch, and dinner on, you know, funny incidents that lead to Ralph eating the whole thing. Uh, so I'm going to hand over to Mike again at this point um, for the demos, um, you know, and, and really taking you through this experience. All right. So we exit out of that, and we'll, we're back to our uh, mocked-up YouTube page. And I promise this time I'm going to give you all a little bit more time before I start talking after the, the video plays. 
Um, the first thing I want to do, you notice the ad is on, on the upper right-hand corner there, is again I want to talk just real quickly about the media settings because the way we produced the creative here was we wanted to, to uh, be able to dynamically tailor the creative based on, again, what we know about the user. And that could be demographic information like age or gender. It could be location information. It could be interest-based information. And when we, we planned for that during the film, the filming of this, the, these uh, 1970s sitcoms. And so what I'm going to do, again, normally this would happen behind the scenes, but I'm going to go and hit custom settings, and we're just going to sort of force it um, to, to follow a certain profile. So let's start with interest. Um, let's pick advertising, since that's a passion point for a lot of us. Demographic, right? Do we, uh, do we think that there are teens in the household? Let's say yes. Income, um, let's hope, uh, you know, high, high income. Uh, let's choose weather, right? It can pull in your location. We've planned for sun, you name it. We'll keep it at sun. Uh, time of day, I'm actually going to select morning, and I'll get to that later. And then location, let's do uh, where I am right now, which is New York City. Uh, what happens now? I'm going to hit play. Uh, I'm going to be quiet and let you all see how all of those inputs um, affect the, the creative that you're about to see. Don't let the itty bitty bumps in the road get you down. Put on a smile and head for the bright lights of town. If you're going to do anything, do the whole thing. If you're going to do anything, do the whole thing. Life is a feast, so go and make it. Those all around, just reach out and take it. If you're going to do anything, do the whole thing, the whole thing. Okay, um, we, we're stopping it midway through the, the sitcom. There's about another minute there if you want to check it out later. But what I want to do is, is sort of talk to a few things that, that we just saw in the creative. Again, we, we, we saw a bit about the, the media settings up front, location, interest, and demographics. Um, and that, dro that drove some of the creative that you saw. So we mentioned we're in New York City. Using Google Street View, we pull in the imagery from Street View to populate the back, you know, the rear view window of Irv's car so he's driving through Times Square. Um, we talk about uh, the presence of teens in the house, and if you notice in that opening montage, um, there are kids sitting around a dinner table. If we had selected no children, it would have shown a completely different scene. Uh, even things like income, if we can infer high or low income, we can change the clothes uh, that characters are wearing in the film. So you notice that some of the people were wearing blazers, indicative of a higher income. Um, the other thing I wanted to call your attention to was little interactive moments like changing the radio station. We filmed that same car crash scene half a dozen times uh, with, with Ralph listening to 
different music. I selected country because I'm a big country fan. You could easily select hip-hop or heavy metal um, and therefore affect the storyline. In other parts of the, uh, the sitcoms, uh, you can even call, using your mobile phone, call into the ad, and Ralph will answer in real time and have a conversation with you, you as a person and, and Ralph as a character in the ad. Uh, but again, it was this idea of how do we make the creative uh, not only uh, relevant and personalized to the individual user, but how do we make it fun and interactive and kind of bring you into Ralph's world uh, and share you know, just a bit more about the day Ralph ate the whole thing. Uh, so I'm, what I'm going to do uh, as you wrap up this case study is I'm going to bring us back to uh, the, the presentation. All right. So, uh, thanks, Mike. So guys, as you saw there, right, there's a lot of uh, you know, personalization going on in the video. And that was really the, the big sort of technology inside in this story was that an idea that resonated in a mass broadcast 40 years ago. Um, had to be adapted to be deeply personal in the digital world because the two defining features in the digital world are sort of data and interactivity and the fact that, you know, as advertisers and marketers, we have a lot of knowledge and data about, um, you know, the environment in which the ad is being seen. And the more we can tailor the ad to that environment, the stickier it becomes. Uh, and then interactivity uh, was another critical factor was how do you bring interactive features that let people influence a story, but in a way uh, you know that that's a part of the story rather than just choose your own, own adventure type stories. And um, so that was really another big experiment you know from a technology standpoint in dynamic video, uh, but really you know the inside thing if you have a lot of data on your audience, um, you know and, and and simple interactivity that can be built into the ads once you marry the two. We can create deeply personal ad experiences, you know, that stick longer uh, with the ad and, and bring people in in a more participatory way um, than sort of more traditional forms of, uh, of storytelling. Um, so, if you move on to the next one, now we're going to talk about um, Avis, um, and it's one of the most recognized campaigns. Some of you might have actually read about it uh, in, in business school um, around "We Try Harder," and it was started uh, in 1962 by Paula Green. Uh, with a simple premise that you know uh, that if you're not number one, you have to try harder. Um, that has been Avis's tagline for the last 50 years, and it speaks to the uh, longevity of uh, of the insight and the bigness of the idea. Uh, you know, over the 50 years, uh, so that was the first ad that ran, um, you know, one of the first ads that ran in 1962 as a print campaign, and then it evolved uh, across multiple mediums. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to listen from Paula, a little clip from the film, on her explaining on where the idea came from and uh, what the film was about. It's very simple, but if you look at it, it is an argument. It is a syllogism. We're number two, but we try harder. We're putting our name on the line. We can't afford to give you a dirty car. We can't afford to give you windshield wipers that don't wipe. We can't afford to give you dirty ashtrays. We presented a company that was willing to work for you. It was sort of like tacking up the manifesto on the door. And the one thing I'm sure we did is kind of write a manual for the whole rent-a-car business. I think we hit a chord. People talked about it a lot. They were intrigued by it. So when people started to say, hey, we saw your ad and it's terrific, Everybody kind of perked up. Uh, they began to be very proud, and the whole organization changed. The cars got better care. The customers got better care. They began to get a lot more customers. Their advertising has included the We Try Harder for years. Um, so that was Paula Green, uh, you know, one of the legendary uh, creative directors in the industry. Um, and as you saw in the, in the clip, right, it was something that was not just an advertising campaign for Avis. It was something that transformed Avis and later uh, the entire rent-a-car business um, in terms of the customer care um, that was provided and, and what it meant uh, to give customer service um, at a level that made people happy. Um, the 50 years on, that was a big challenge for us uh, on how do you bring customer service to life in a digital form because Really, traditionally, you know, customer service has been you either tell people what you do or you show people what you've done um, with your customer service. And as we went through this, you know, this, this project, it was one of the more tougher exercises uh, in trying to crack. The thing um, that we started finding was 
something that had stayed consistent with AWS for the last 50 years was that people still write into AWS real handwritten physical letters along with emails and, and what have you telling them about their customer service, both you know, uh, bouquets and, and brickbats. Um, but, but that gave us an insight uh, into how could you build a platform that allowed all the customers in the world um, to, or all Avis customers in the world to actually tell their story um, and, and allow Avis to you know, really build a crowdsource campaign that tells people what they actually do and how they try harder. Um, so we built this platform in this digital ad that works on uh, tablets and that allows you to type in your story. It takes a little bit of input on you know, where you rented your car, what type of car you rented, um, and then you get this free form text box where you can enter you know, 140 characters of your story um, of what you, what you rented, and Mike's just going to do a demo of that. Um, but then ultimately we give you a personalized 30 second film generated right within the ad that you can share with your friends and it addresses both the, the good stories where we make a beautiful film and, and thank customers for their uh, wonderful experience. And then uh, in case of you know, tougher situations, it gives Avis a chance to uh, you know, go and fix the situation. So I'm going to hand it over to Mike at this point. All right. Thanks, Amon. Uh, so what I'm going to do, I'm just going to jump right into it. And uh, we'll go through the actual the customer experience that you might, you might receive, and then we'll talk a little bit about what's going on behind the scenes. Uh, but again, here I am on, on sort of a, a, a YouTube page. Let's say I've rented from Avis in the, pa in the past. Uh, they know that, and maybe I'm on a remarketing list or past customer list. And I see this ad that says, watch, uh, watch personal Avis rental stories created by our customers or create yours. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to go ahead and hit uh, create mine. Okay, and like Amin said, it collects a little bit of, of information up front. So again, my name is Mike. I'm a mister. Uh, I'm going to say I rented uh, from Philadelphia, which is my hometown. We put in all of Avis's uh, U.S. locations into this ad. What kind of car did I rent? Let's see. Rented a BMW. Again, put in Avis's fleet of rental vehicles into the ad. Uh, who helped me? If I remember the name of the customer service, uh, and person, I can put that in here. So let's go ahead and say Pat. Um, and this is why we asked for gender, right? Because Pat could be a Mr. or a Mrs. And we certainly don't want to mess that up when we play back this 30 second film. So in this case, Pat is a Ms. Uh, and I was pleased. And now you get this freeform text box, 140 characters or, or less, to share your story of how Avis tried harder. So um, let's say uh, while vacationing in Philadelphia, I left my iPod, the back seat of the car. Pat promptly sent it back to me. Thank you, Avis. All right. And we hit next. And what it's going to do now is it takes about 10 seconds to pull all that information, my name, location, BMW, and my short story, and it's going to turn that into a 30-second film that's, pers that's personalized to me and, and my story. Um, after, we, after we view it, we'll, uh, we'll let Amin sort of talk about the nuts and bolts of, as to what's going in the background. Piece of customer feedback helps Avis check the little fish aren't acting like the big fish. We just received one from Mike. After passing through an Avis branch in Philadelphia, he realized he misplaced his iPod. Was it in the glove box? Under the seat. Trap behind the bathroom sink. One of our employees, Pat, was happy to help, searching high and low until she found the item and mailed it back to where it belonged. We're still a little hungry. Customers aren't a dime a dozen to us. That's why we can't afford not to return a lost item. Right, guys, so as you saw um, in that ad, I'm just going to obviously wrap up. Uh, um, you, know, you can, of course, share the film, uh, book a rental, um, you know, that you know, make the campaign social. Um, but the core behind the idea is, is, is two things, right? One is, well, why does this matter to Avis, right? And what we found is, you know, on the social sphere today, everybody has a soapbox, and people are talking about um, their rental experiences. And more often than not, you hear about when things go wrong than you, when things go right. Um, so the idea was, what if we source that wisdom of the crowds 
um, and not only let people just post about it on social media, we went out and actively reached out to them and said, hey, tell us your story, you know, how are we doing? Uh, and, and, you know, that becomes your campaign where you're putting the company out there and, and its service out there. And when, you know, what we haven't demoed here is what happens if somebody has a bad experience. And in that instance, um, we recognize that sentiment. Um, and we allow people, you know, uh, to tell us their story. We give them, tell them, we apologize for the service that was subpar. Um, and ultimately give them an opportunity to help let us fix that by, you know, give, could be giving a coupon, could be giving a free upgrade, um, you know, could be giving them free miles if they are Avis preferred member, any, any number of things that Avis could do. But simply asking them for their phone number or email or way to contact them. So it goes and extends that idea of, hey, people are already talking about us, let's go ahead and address it. And, and it's, it's, you know, it's a slightly risky campaign from that perspective. So that's sort of the marketing side of this. And then from the nuts and bolts side, you know, there are a couple of pieces. There's a lot of, of course, animations that are stitched together. Um, um, you know, we have, I think, about across video and the audio clips, I have close to 20,000 clips that are fundamentally, we process the natural language that's written uh, in that story and understand, you know, story scenarios, ultimately what type of sentiment somebody's trying to say, um, and then really build a video out of for that with different music, different audio, because you can imagine like losing an iPod is very different, you know, sort of tonality than if you had an accident and, and you needed emergency services uh, from Avis um, to help you on the side of the road. So that's something where, you know, this ad goes on and on. It's sort of from a technology standpoint, a self-learning ad, that the more stories people create, the easier it becomes for us to optimize, uh, you know, the quality of these films. Uh, so that's really, you know, where this is going. And of course, as you saw in Mike's demo, um, the front end of the ad can be optimized. If we know for sure you've rented, we can take you straight into the story writing experience versus if we know you're somebody who hasn't rented, we can show you more stories that have been created from, uh, you know, customers, uh, you know, who are happy with the Avis uh, service. Uh, so that's about Avis. Um, next, we're going to go into, you know, the loss of our campaigns uh, from Coca-Cola. Um, and what you're about to see is the Coca-Cola Hilltop ad. Some of you might actually know this. It was not only one of the most iconic television ads of all time, but also a transformative ad in Coca-Cola's marketing history because it was a point where Coca-Cola shifted from being a functional beverage that quenched your thirst and, and refreshed you when you were thirsty um, to something much bigger, you know, something that people connected over. So I'm going to let Mike play um, the ad, and then we'll come back to it in a second. I'd like to buy the world a home and furnish it with love. Grow apple trees and honeybees and snow white turtle doves. I like to teach the world to sing. Sing with me. Perfect harmony. Perfect harmony. I like to buy the world a coke and keep it company. Guys, you saw that was, you know, um, and, and Adam, and then that, to be honest, like I've heard that song more than any other song in my life uh, over the last nine months. Um, but there are actually three very interesting things that were going on in that ad, right? It was, it was very aspirational. And, you know, aspirational in three parts. One was the actual message of the ad, as I mentioned earlier. It moved from a functional benefit of the product to an emotional benefit that everybody could relate to around the world. Even though it was a mass ad, it spoke to you one-on-one. -on -one. Um, then the second piece was actually it was the first ever United Chorus of the World, and as you saw, uh, today we take it for granted, but back in 1971, you know, having people from all around the world and all races and cultures had never been done before on television in America, um, and that racial diversity, you know, raised the level of, of what that, that ad meant, um, you know, in the social context. And then, you know, third part was really the social context of the war and conflict right after the Vietnam War. Uh, you know, and Coke became a harbinger of peace and, and, and you know, a harmony 
um, around the world, and again, really elevated itself up from being you know, a beverage to something a lot bigger, right? Um, and it, it's one of, you know, sort of, uh, you know, Coke's more defining ads by, you know, things that they sort of hold very dear to their brand. Um, and as you can see, you know, that, that string even today in the open happiness campaign that they're running. So our challenge when we came up with this was, you know, how do you take that with something so iconic uh, and that everybody loved so much and bring it to life in a completely uh, different way? Um, so we went back and worked with Harvey Gabor, who was the original art director on the campaign, to really try and understand the insight on how the ad came about. Um, and then I'm going to indulge a little bit of uh, a spot of history was that the ad came about at Shannon Airport um, where you know, the original composer of song, Bill Backer, saw people from all, all around the world um, stuck in an airport because of you know, uh, weather conditions, actually just communicating with each other and, and sharing coats with each other, and, and that's where he composed the song. And then um, Harvey you know, created the first United Course of the World on this hilltop, uh, bringing all of those people together with that message and, and you know, of its, in its time, it was the most advanced medium of telling people, you know, how Coke is the way people connect with each other. And that was the idea that we latched on to. What if we could bring that promise of, can, you know, buying the world a Coke to life um, in a way that today's technology can by actually allowing people to send, you know, messages um, with a free Coke through specially designed vending machines around the world. So from your phone or your desktop, you can record a video or text message um, and send it to you know a few uh, hand, a few selected machines around the world, uh, you know, and somebody who's at the machine then goes up thinking they're about to buy a coke, except they get a free coke and your message, and can reply back to you with a video or a text message, which you can get in the ad or in an email. Um, so I'm going to hand it back to Mike for actually demoing the ad and 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 sending a live message to a machine. All right. So for our last uh, live demo of the day, uh, let's go ahead and send a, you know, buy the world a Coke by sending one across the country. Um, so the first thing I want to do uh, is just, I'm actually going to refresh this page so you can see um, what the initial part of the ad experience would be. Um, if we hadn't shown you that commercial, um, you, could, you would get the, the original ad again. And furnish it with love. Grow apple tree. I'm going to go ahead and click through that um, because we've heard it. It's actually going to play it one more time for us. We'll just hit hit mute. Um, and what it says now is send a free Coca-Cola across the world. Share a little happiness with someone you've never met. Um, so what we do now is we hit uh, send now. Now, like Amin said, we had designed uh, a handful of these, these specially built vending machines um, that we basically hacked into so that they communicate uh, with the web and with Google's ad server. Um, we, right now we've got two that are online. We have one uh, here in New York City, and we have one out in Mountain View at Google's headquarters. So let's go ahead right now, and, and we're going to send one to uh, Mountain View US. So we choose that. Uh, now it says add a message to your Coca-Cola. We hit add now. And what you see here is a little Adobe Flash pop-up that is basically asking me for permission to turn on my webcam. And when I do that, you guys are going to see me. Um, all right, so with my permission, webcam comes on. And I'm going to hit record. It gives me a quick countdown. And then I have about 10 seconds to uh, send a message along with this free Coke. So let's hit record. Hey, Mountain View, Mike from New York City, sending you guys this free Coke. Hope you guys enjoy. All right, we hit stop. What it does there is it's going to allow me to review it to uh, make sure I'm, I'm happy with it. Now, for the camera shy folks, uh, you can also write in a text message complete with emoticons uh, if that is your fancy. But let's go ahead and hit send. And what it does right now, it's processing the video. Um, we pull in Google Maps. Now, our IP address here in New York City actually maps to Atlanta, so it thinks I'm in Atlanta right now even though we're in New York City. Um, but then you'll see it, it goes above the clouds, this, this Coke red ribbon, and lands in Mountain View, again pulling in Street View again uh, on the Mountain View campus. 
and then this is what the vending machine looks like. So all of that happens in a matter of, say, 20 to 30 seconds. Um, we've put moderation in place. You can imagine that neither Coke nor Google would want anything um, uh, inappropriate to go through you know, this ad. And so we have a moderation service that, re that reviews every single message, both text and video, to make sure it is on brand. Um, and now what happens is in Mountain View, we've got one of these vending machines, and our free Coke and my video message is lined up for some uh, random person who passes by. And um, what they are treated to is they walk by the machine, they hear that I'd like to buy the world a Coke, um, and it says press here to open happiness. And then they get my message, they get a free Coke, they, uh, and then they have an opportunity to, to send a message back to me, and that message appears in this ad unit right here. Um, now, we don't have time to do that right now, so I'm actually going to close back because we've got a really great video that kind of captures uh, the essence of this whole consumer experience. And so um, to, to one last point to, to reiterate before we watch that video is, again, the whole, the whole intention with this reimagined Hilltop campaign was uh, to really play up the idea Coke is so much more than a product. Uh, it connects. Uh, strangers across the world, and that was really the goal with this, to, to say how can we use technology to connect people across the world, or in this case from New York City to Mountain View. Um, now back in, in December, we actually did a field test of this, of this ad, and we put a number of these machines uh, around the world. It's a couple in New York, Mountain View, one in Cape Town, one in Buenos Aires. And then what we did is we just sent out a camera crew, and we wanted to see what, what would consumer reactions actually be. And so what I want to do is, just to close, I want to show you guys uh, the footage of, of this actual field test. Hey, it's me, Bulelani. I'm wishing you a great Christmas. Thanks for the call. Hi, I'm Lee from Cape Town. Thank you very much for this call. Thank you. Me encanta. La voy a disfrutar mucho. Bought the Coke, thanks, Dave. Thank you. Thank you. That's the best Coke I've ever had. So, guys, that was you know a little montage from our field test, and, and um, as you saw, like you know, people were really surprised, and it, it worked in the real world. Um, you know, that's really from us for uh, this presentation today. Um, hopefully this gave you a good flavor of where we came in this project and what we have sort of tried to accomplish here. And hopefully some of you are inspired to go, you know, uh, do more of these on your own. And I'd also like to thank Mike for, you know, uh, the amazing demos and, and all the work here. Mike, do you want to add anything else? Uh, no, everything you guys saw today, A, we'll send out the deck uh, to those of you on the call, and B, um, lots more demos and videos and content at projectrebrief.com, uh, including the documentary that we just released a few weeks ago at the Cannes Lions Festival. So uh, thank you all uh, for joining us today. We really appreciate it, and um, we're going to sign off from there. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.